नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू बी आई सी टॉक्स अ पॉडकास्ट बाय बैंगलोर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ब्रिंगिंग यू कॉन्वर्जेशन दैट मूव इन फॉर्म एंड एनकरेज डिस्कॉस when the then vice president of south africa thabo mbeki and his wife zenile mbeki were visiting india they visited the taj mahal and i was on what may be called official duty when they arrive the guide there welcomes them saying welcome your excellencies to this monument to love where lies buried the great mumtaz mahal mother of the emperor's 14 children and zenile mbeki said what <laughs> 14 children yes your excellency she was the mother of his 14 children and died in the 14th cha- and she said i am not going in she said i am not going in and then mbeki went up to her and must have said something to her like don't create a diplomatic scandal you have to come in <laughs> india the world's largest democracy the land of yoga spirituality and a rich civilizational past and is without a doubt an exciting place to be in the 21st century our nation at the same time struggles with the rising gap between the rich and the poor ignorance social unrest and strained communal harmony one is always overwhelmed and bewildered by its contradictions wondering at the many indias that coexist as an effervescent mix despite such unique diversity As the country navigates its way into the new millennium, a question often asked is, are we moving in the right direction? Even more important is the question of who is qualified to comment. In this episode of BIC Talks, a panel consisting of author, diplomat and former governor of West Bengal, Gopal Krishna Gandhi, ACS Panchayat Raj Government of Karnataka, Uma Mahadevan Das Gupta, and opinion editor at Deccan Herald, S. Raghuttam, discuss the book Our India by Captain G R Gopinath entrepreneur and author and now over to Raghutam so the first excerpt is from an article that he wrote in the times of india it's titled chinese capers in ladakh how to stand up to a bully my first border posting after the bangladesh liberation war in december 1971 was on the chinese front in january 1972 at point 4752 there was no name to this peak that stood towering at 4752 meters at chola in the state of sikkim just a few kilometers along the border to the north of nathula it was an observation post the highest in the region desolate and forbidding it would be snowbound most of the year with the maximum temperatures in summers being minus 2 to 3 degrees centigrade and in winters dropping to minus 30 degrees centigrade My concrete bunker was perched right atop 4752. A few meters below was the infantry battalion, the Jammu and Kashmir Rifles, 1st JNK RIF. I had my course mate, 2nd Lieutenant Chidi Bakshi, now a retired Major General, military historian, analyst and a well-known television face, irrepressible even then, posted there, who provided cheery company. When weather permitted, we would go down to the battalion mess to toast over an evening of rum. The Chinese were just 200 yards across the imaginary border that ran across a lake that remained frozen in winter. 4752 was a four-hour trek from Changu Lake at 10,000 feet, where my regiment was headquartered. I stayed on that post for 15 months. So this is Captain Gopinath, the soldier. The second excerpt is from an article that we published in the Deccan Herald. Anadatta Sukhi Baba, Sardars of Generosity. He was writing this in the midst of the farmer's agitation. Many years later, after retirement from the army, when I became a farmer, I was traveling on my Enfield motorcycle with my wife and three-year-old daughter from Hassan town to my farm, a distance of 50 kilometers. Suddenly, I had a flat tire in the middle of nowhere. It was noon, and I realized we were some 10 kilometers from the nearest town where we, would, we could get the tire fixed. Then I saw a lone farmer in a field tucked in a mango orchard. Noticing that I was in distress, he walked towards me on seeing I had my wife and kid and observing the flat tire without a moment of hesitation. He put us at ease with his disarming smile and led us to his house and introduced us to his wife. He then gave me his tractor and a farmhand to ferry the bike 
to the town for repair and assured me that my wife and kid could relax in the meantime. I returned by two in the afternoon, ravenously hungry. I profusely thanked him and wished to take his leave. He said it was lunchtime and he would not let us leave without sharing the meal with his family. It was such a delicious repast that it surpassed any banquet for the potentates. When you are lost and famished and are invited by a generous and genial sardar to bake bread over wine or by a farmer to join in the family lunch, a humble meal offered by the affable host has no equal. And now, when I see the earthly farmers sitting in protest on the borders of Delhi, forsaken and forlorn, those denizens of our rural heartland who tirelessly till and toil on their lands to feed us all year, my heart aches and goes out in prayer for them for an early resolution. That's the second excerpt. A man who feels and who feels deeply. Third one is probably more interesting. The phone rang at 10 that night. Malia, notorious for not adhering to schedule and known to keep people waiting, was intuitive enough to realize that it would be unwise to postpone this call. Gopi, I'm on the yacht. Guests are streaming in. I could hear peals of laughter and greetings and could imagine the swish, glamorous set of swashbuckling men and beautiful women sashaying in silk. I could even smell the heady melange of exotic perfumes and hear the music in the background. The phone rang well past midnight again. Gopi, Vijay here. Sorry for waking you up. Now, Malia is not exactly the kind to apologize for being late. It gave me an inkling that he was desperate to do the deal and see Kingfisher Airlines fly abroad as the rules then mandated a minimum of five years service to operate foreign flights. Air Deccan could enable that for Kingfisher as it had been operational for the required period. Further, since Air Deccan was listed, it would make it easier for Malia to raise money from the market. The conversation that followed went on like this. The figures are approximate. Vijay, get hold of a pen. Here we go. I say. First, I want rupees 160 per share. Second, I'll be the chairman and you can be the vice chairman. Third, we will have 12 directors out of which I will appoint three and you can pick three while the six independent directors are to be jointly appointed. Four, a professional CEO will be appointed jointly by me and you to run Air Deccan and report to its board. Elaborating my terms, I told him that the above would translate into around 500 crores in investments in Air Deccan for a 26% stake. You have to infuse rupees 500 crore more via purchase of shares in the open offer. I want an advance from you in demand draft in favor of Air Deccan for 200 crore within three days, delivered at Deccan's office along with a binding term sheet. I'll call a board meeting only after that and present the proposal to the board. The balance rupees 300 crore should be invested within 30 days or else the advance of 200 crore will be forfeited, I added. Here it is pertinent to note that contrary to the general perception, I did not sell the airline to Malia by transferring my shares or those of my other promoter friend to collect rupees 500 crore. I neither sold even one share to Malia nor received a rupee for it. I was getting him to invest in Air Deccan so that I could continue to be involved with my airline. Yes, Gopi, done, he replied. My president, Ravi Nedangudi, will contact you tomorrow to work out and close the term sheet. The demand draft will be delivered in Deccan's corporate office on Wednesday. I got to run. The guests are waiting. Cheers. I could imagine him dissolving back into that happy world of fashionable women and rich and gallant men of high society as his yacht of glitz and glamour swayed on the Mediterranean waves. I wasn't sure if I was dreaming for the deal was done in flat 30 minutes. So that's... Captain Gopinath, the businessman, the hard-minded, hard-hearted businessman who got a deal done in 30 minutes. I guess that gives a flavor of the man in all his avatars. Although, as Ian Nainan has written in his foreword in the book, Captain Gopinath is a man who is more than the sum of his parts. So with that, I'll start off. I keep wondering why this man, who has done a whole lot of great things in life, writes and writes for newspapers. But rather than me commenting on that, I'd like to open by asking Captain Gopnath to make some open remarks and then followed by Mr. Gandhi and Omar. Thanks, Raghu. Right from my younger days, in the officer's mess when I used to be in the army, I would always get into arguments like that youngster who came and spoke here, getting agitated, getting into big arguments about what is happening in the country. And we always find that either you are agitated about it and you do nothing, or you 
you are cynical and you skeptical and cynical about everything and uh, the third is you do something about it and i found myself you know sitting over a drink and criticizing all the time then i realized that cynicism and losing yourself in hopelessness and despair is not the answer you have to lose yourself in action and lose yourself in some kind of creative pursuit so i resigned from the army after about 8 years of service and 8 years of training and somehow i was longing to come back and i went back to my farm and when i came back to the farm the farm that i imagined did not exist because most of the lands in my village where i wanted to come back to gorur which is a picturesque beautiful village where i grew up that had got submerged under the dam himavati and wherever i went in the bus stand in the temples in the farms taluk office wherever you went the one talk was where are they going to settle about 60 villages were submerged and gorur itself was spared but all the lands were submerged and there was a deep uprooting of uh, people overnight people became homeless or exiles in their own land the government as you know does not give let's say 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs in one shot there are middlemen there there are brokers there who act in between the land acquisition officer and the farmer because the farmer can't sign anything and their lawyers and a lot of that money is is gone there and the money that they receive is comes in bits and pieces and the land that they get is in a different land different space in my case it was about 100 kilometers away my father said you know we have lands but none of us are gone and it is again barren lands there is no approach road there is no electricity there is no la- there is no water there is no school there is no hospital it's barren lands so he said that uh, you mad he was a teacher you know like they say he was a poor teacher of a school in the village you were just resigned and come back i said yes you know i feel that uh, what i have learned in the army i uh, have energy take and i can think i'm sure i can make a life by myself is there no farming is is not like anything else so a whole night you know he was sitting next to me in in that room you know he was on the cot and i was sleeping below till about 4:00 uh, in the morning he kept telling me that is not a good idea so i made about 5:00 in the morning he started saying maybe if you plant this maybe if you do that maybe if you do that that's a better crop so i took a motorcycle and went to that place it was a barren land about 5 kilometers from jawgal they were all large grazing lands of the maharaja of mysore in those days which was then in the department of the amrit mahal kavals and so when you build a dam you lose fertile lands you lose forest lands then again you lose common grounds what they call the commons which are allotted to people to rehabilitate so i went there walked those 5 kilometers i stood on that hill there and i felt uh, as i looked at it i was dreaming and as i was dreaming i was the dream was growing on me and i, I could imagine that i could live on this land i could read i could plow the land i picked up a sort of soil smelt it and i was overcome you know i was a little romantic and i said this is this is what i should do i should live on this land so i came to bangalore picked up a army tent a second hand tent there was a harijan boy in my house who was actually a dalit boy who was on this unwritten bonded labor so i said why don't you come with me he was 14 he said yes in the case there is also a freedom for him along with him and i had a doberman dog and I had an army rifle put together everything and went in a tent and pitched my tent there and that's how i've always been that you know if something comes over me i rush headlong into it of course it's got me into trouble it's also got me out of trouble and i think like farmers right they are the greatest inspiration for me and i think for all of us because regardless of the calamities regardless of every kind of ups and downs that he faces he never stops plowing his land he rises in the morning good shoulder to the plow with his wife into even today goes and plows because he never doubts the sun will not rise he never doubts it will not rain so there is optimism all the time the optimism at a time when you know everything is crushing you so on the day when i went to the farm i reached there at about 7 o'clock in the night it was already dark so i had seen a nice spot there and because there is a stream we had loaded everything and we clear the undergrowth there's a lot of thorns there we pitched a tent and i asked this harijan boy along with another harijan person a two carpenters to start cooking the meal so by the time the meal was cooked 
it was about 10 o'clock in the night. Then I said, let's sit and have dinner. So the two carpenters, they're called Vishwakarmas. And they were not eating. They thought I had brought food from my mother from the village. Then somebody came and whispered to me saying that they will not eat because the Harijans have cooked it. But I knew from my army days that a hungry stomach knows, <laughs> knows no religion. So I made them wait. Then I said, okay, sir. And I started eating. So those guys looked here and there. They were very hungry. It was about 11 o'clock at night. And they started eating. So this untouchability runs deep in the country. It runs even today. This is relevant in the context in we are in today because when we say why people have converted to Islam, it is because we shut our temples to them. We shut our homes to them. I was initially under the impression it is Brahmins who, are, who don't eat from the Harijans or the untouchables of Dalits. But we find that the Gaudas, the Lingais, the Achar, what they call the Vishwakarmas, they are more uh, what they call orthodox. They will not go near any utensil that they touch. All these things always affected me. And then I said the way to come out of it is not to be critical all the time because there are also good things. You know, you must admire the good things in life. Have the magnanimity of spirit to admire people who are doing good things. Because there are a lot of people who are doing good things who are more courageous than me, who are more uh, better than me as human beings. You have to look at them and be cheerful and forget it in love and forget it in friendship and do what you can. And that's how I took to writing a few years ago. It's a long story. Shikanti, <laughs> <laughs> if I can come to you to make some opening remarks. You have written a beautiful foreword to the book. I wish someday I also write a book and someday somebody writes as good a foreword to the book as you have written for the captain's book. What does the captain and his thoughts and writings represent to you at this particular moment in time in India? Let me try to answer your question somewhat unconventionally. I'll start with the person who has brought all of us together here today. You know, there is this phrase which occurs in all our languages, really, really, in Tamil, Nijama, in Hindi, Sachme, well, Urdu, Vakai. What does that mean? When somebody says something and you're surprised that such a thing really exists, you say, really? When I was first introduced by concept to Captain Gopinath, it was by a mutual friend of ours, Vidwan T.M. Krishna, who said, you're going to Bangalore, you must meet a friend of ours called Captain Gopinath, who, I don't know how to start describing him, he has flown airlines, he's a farmer. He goes on holidays to see his daughter in France, but he lives in his village when he is here. I'll only say Captain Gopinath is a very real person. So that was my introduction to Captain Gopinath. He's a real person. So what does that real, being real mean? Being real means, first of all, not being fake. It's just as simple as that. Today in India, to come to your question, the distinction between true and false, real and fake, is becoming so blurred that we now have something called real fake and truly artificial. One has to now live in perpetual doubt about the authenticity of things. The three impromptu observations that were made from the lectern alluded each in its own way to how we have drifted away from what is such and what is not so. I will round off by saying that in enlarging the subject from the subject of the book to reflections about India, really is a testimony to the realness, the essential trueness of this book, which has become a rarity. To speak without wanting to make an impact, to write without wanting to be quoted, to sing without wanting an applause, to dance without expecting a raving review, but just for the sake of one's own inner satisfaction about being true 
is what this book is about. The reference to the Vidhana Sauda made by the second impromptu speaker today was very close to my appreciation of not just Bangalore and that magnificent structure, but to the realities of our time in which we see this magnificence and we know that it is solid. Unlike the magnificences which we also see and admire and uh, are vowed by, which we know are not solid. The Vidhana Saudha, like the Taj Mahal, is not just a building but a metaphor. And I think it will be true to say that India is known for three things mainly. And all three are utterly such. Nijam, Unmai, Vakai, Hakikat, Shotto. One, the Taj Mahal. India is remembered and known and hailed for many things, but if there's one symbol for India, it's the Taj. And as a metaphor, not just as what Tagore called the teardrop on the cheek of time, it is that, but as a metaphor. What is it a metaphor of? Of the truth of India's pluralism. We don't know how many Hindus built it, how many Jains may have been part of the enterprise, from which parts of India the metals and the minerals came, which parts of the world they came, all to create this magnificence, a tribute not only to a man's love of his wife, but to the aesthetics of India. Second, and I say this objectively, without a trace of anything other than objectivity, the Taj Mahal, and then Mohandas K. Gandhi. There is something utterly true about him. One can disagree with him, as I do on many, especially three matters, which are so inconsequential that I need not list them. But he is true. The third is India's democracy, electoral democracy, about which again reference was made. India's pluralism, India's readiness to face the truth, and India's completely new and successful and sensationally successful use of electoral democracy. These are three things which keep our soul intact. Thank you. Do you want to share some impressions of the book? and the man you have gathered from the book. That was very beautiful, and I'm not sure if uh, I can match up to that kind of vision which you have laid out, sir. On the book itself and about the impressions of the writer of the book, what I'd like to say is I'd like to go back to an anecdote from the book itself. I think we were briefly discussing it in between on phone at some point. When Captain Gopinath was looking around and in discussion with his creative agency for a mascot or a brand ambassador for a Deccan, some of the creative team members suggested that he should go for somebody like a film star or somebody who's a really big celebrity and so on. So he knocked off that suggestion, ruled it out, saying that, first of all, it doesn't make sense. This is an airline for the common person. And secondly, it's also going to be extremely expensive to get a celebrity or a film star. So we'll be bleeding. So there's both the common sense as well as the businessman speaking. Then why not you yourself? Why not Captain Gopinath himself? And he immediately ruled out that suggestion too, saying that that would be extreme hubris. I think that's also a very telling thing. And then he notices, I think it was in a newspaper that you noticed a cartoon. He notices really a cartoon. cartoon by Lakshman, R.K. Lakshman in which I think there's a rustic village person because now airline fares are going cheaper and drastically affordable. And so there's this rustic gentleman who's perched in an airline seat inside an aircraft and he's got his bistar and everything rolled up. His rail chombu is also there on the floor. And this gentleman sitting nearby wearing a suit and very dapper turns to the person on his left and the person on his left is the common man of R.K. Lakshman and says, you know, if the fares go down any further, I'm going to start traveling by train again. So, <laughs> so I like this anecdote. And of course, as a result of this cartoon, 
Captain Gopinath contacted R. K. Lakshman and the common man. That's a little bit of business legend, I think, in India. That the common man of R. K. Lakshman became the mascot for Air Deccan, which is which is a lovely little story. But it's also a lovely little story about the person behind the airline or the business and how a he was a savvy businessman, but he was also a person who didn't take himself too seriously. And that's something that runs through the book. We need, I think, in these times, more people who neither take themselves too seriously nor others, but can read, reflect, and interact with people, whether it be the farmer on the way to Hassan, who invites them in for a meal at his table, at his humble table, or whether it be Vijamalya calling up uh, late at night to offer a deal on the airline, or anyone else among the many luminaries, Jasraj and Girish Karnad and T.M. Krishna himself that Captain Gopinath writes about. What I liked was this ability to bring a very common sense, practical approach to writing, but also with a lot of clarity to read and reflect. Reading alone is not enough. You know, reading and regurgitating, we've seen so much of it with the explosion of the internet, is not enough. But reflecting and being able to bring the essence of something and also to address not only the day-to-day -day issues, but also to address the philosophical issues with a common sense approach and with a humane approach. Common sense, as we discussed, not in a hard-nosed, hard-boiled way, but with a sense of humanity and empathy. For example, quoting from Dostoevsky, where Ivan is telling Alyosha that there's this huge problem of evil in the world, but what I want to see is justice, and I want to see justice done in this lifetime, in this world. And here is a writer who managed to pin that down. In this huge tome of Dostoevsky, this is the essence, that if there's evil, what we need to do is to work towards ensuring justice in our lifetime. And I kept coming across moments like that in the book. And that was really something that really stood out for me. The next question was going to be about that. I mean, you quote Tagore in one piece on entrepreneurs, Tolstoy in another on the internet economy, and you cite Yudhishthira as a bad example in a piece on banking. Bertrand Russell, Montaigne, Louis Pasteur, Charles Dickens, Shakespeare on love, Octavio Paz on Hinduism in India. Some obscure speech of Albert Camus from 1948. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, Emerson, Quimpo, Wordsworth, everybody is in your book and your articles. Napoleon seems to be a favorite, probably coming from your army background. And Henry Kissinger, Douglas MacArthur. I mean, I can go on and on. The number of people you sort of quote. How have you managed to read so much in a life as busy as yours has been? and drink from diverse cups, and how do you manage to recall those quotes when you write? Nowadays, sometimes I go to my room to pick up a towel, but when I go there, I forget where I came for, and I go down again. <laughs> but, but I still remember <laughs> some of the quotes, because when I went to school, I went to the local school in Gorur. And you studied in Kannada Medium. And I studied in Kannada Medium, and I, hmm. I, I took an exam for Sanic School Bijapo, and I failed the first time because it was in the English uh, medium. I passed it the second time. And my father took me to Bejapo by train. So whenever he took me on those train journeys, he would read me. I still remember he would read me Gandhi. He would read me Tagore, read me Socrates' dialogues. And he would read all these books to me. And uh, so I think that penetrated. And my uncle, uh, there was a great short story writer. I used to come meet him often. I think something of it must have sort of rubbed off. But I think largely my father who read books to me, especially I showed it to Gopal the other day, all the Harijan cuttings from 1940s, I think, all the Harijan newspaper cuttings, he had cut it and bound it and kept it. It's still there in my house. He worshipped Gandhi. And my mother says that on the day he got assassinated, he came and was weeping. So all this, you know, had some impact on me. And uh, when I got posted in the army, I was there in most of these remote areas and I spent a lot of time reading and that's what saved me. And later when I started going to, when I was in Hassan, I used to go to meet a Tassidar or meet a deputy commissioner or anybody else, a minister. We were always made to wait because the person is already gone for a meeting and they normally don't leave a word for you that they're gone for a meeting. So I always carried a book with me. 
and i found it uh, that uh, in case he was not there I, it was a welcome relief for me i would be carrying a book of either the masi's uh, short stories or kuvempu's uh, short stories in kannada or somerset mom stories or gaidi mopazan stories i would have short stories i have a book bag like uh, somerset mom's there's a famous story called book bag i carry a book of poetry i got the book of poetry of tago for example which is like a great book for me to go back to whenever i want so when i'm writing an article like for example when i was writing this article about ayodhya and the ram janmabhoomi temple was built i just suddenly this quotation came back to me because i read it he says when i ask people to build a temple of love they bring bricks or they bring stones or something like that when i saw that movie of roshamon where i you know the wife is uh, raped and four people watch it or five people watch it each has a different interpretation including the wife herself so i saw this ayodhya you know there were interpretations and interpretations and interpretations each one had his own interpretation of the mosque there and ayodhya there and even amongst the sadhus they were as you know like someone said if you tell uh, the bjp now okay make a hindu rashtra define it i think they they immediately will have a war among hindus <laughs> because no one person can agree what hinduism is so it is basically i carry books wherever i go it is always there with me my car breaks down in the train uh, stops i carry it with me so that comes to the rescue <laughs> super but so i don't complain when i made to wait <laughs> <laughs> okay but enough praise of you captain tell us tales about ourselves when you send articles you write for multiple publications now so how do you decide which publication to send which article to and how do you deal with gatekeepers like me i am a sad arrogant gatekeepers like me the last article that i published of captain gopinath i made him revise it just five times <laughs> <laughs> so i think the last article was hindu rashtra so do you strategize i get intoxicated twice a day <laughs> once in the morning when i'm going on a walk with my music and in the evening and i don't get intoxicated have a drink <laughs> so after i read the paper or need a news flash then this idea comes to me and then it grows on me then i sit to write and of course when you write something like for example i remember i wrote something in those days it was not critical enough of modi for example in one paper one uh, online media so he was not ready to accept it for example i still remember i said that india because you suddenly hear india has become fascist modi is hitler right so i wrote an article which is the subtitle of the book india betwixt and between i said um, would this kejriwal have won this election could mamta banerji have won this election if there is voting fraud so we are not totally he's not a fascist but is he a secular man no he is not secular he doesn't come across as secular though he mouths vasudeva kutakam become often he says constitution is our holy book development is our mantra if you call putin something today you are not there next morning right <laughs> the fact you are there <laughs> yourself <laughs> or in china so i said that he is so someone said you know you are giving him too much credit you have to say this i said no then i quoted that one nelson mandela quote where he said that you assume that this person has goodness in him and then try to talk to him and to change him rather than saying you are a fascist or you are a murderer so then there is no dialogue so i try to write in a manner where i want to engage not only modi in a dialogue because modi will ultimately do i think what electorate wants because for all of them power is the ultimate hype power is the ultimate aphrodisiac if the people who are following modi if they change their perception of hinduism perception of secularism this is not to give a clinch to the congress because we know there are pseudo seculars and there are i think the biggest threat to secularism today is from pseudo seculars just like i wrote in one article hinduism has to be saved from hindutva or rather pseudo hindus so at such times the editors you know if they are too left you know they want me to criticize modi more or and some of them will say they will not accept uh, the other side so then sometimes i pull it out and then if you take it out from hindu i'll give it to you <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> thanks for that <laughs> <laughs> i 
remember once mentioned it was NDTV. I said, no, I said, you are trying to put words in my mouth. This is not what I want to say. This is my article. So you can disagree with me, but you can't make me write that. I said, no. So, so we had a scrap and it uh, stopped sending. <laughs> it's a battle we fight every day. You seem to think we are betwixt and between as a nation, between Hindu Rashtra and secular India, between authoritarianism and liberal democracy. What more do you want to see after the freeing of Bilkis Banu's rapists and the Sanskari Brahmin, therefore they were released? Logic that BJP MLA on the committee came up with. Are we still betwixt and between? I also have also written very, very critical articles on Congress. But I also said Congress must survive. In a sense, it was the very breadth of India. We need Congress, not the Congress as it is, but what Congress stood for. Like even today, what you're seeing in the elections, as you know, is that even during Nehru's time, when he was the Prime Minister, Sardar Patel put up a candidate, Nehru put up a candidate. He was the Prime Minister, he was a colossus, but Sardar Patel put a candidate against Nehru's candidate. This happened in Congress all the time. Similarly, Gandhi, you know, put a candidate, both won against that. So I'm trying to also tell the BJP that this is not good politically, but I think that's what ultimately the language they understand. Like Shiv Sena, for example, which was the most fanatical party, they abandoned uh, their Hindutva and went to bed with Congress and NCP because Hindutva didn't matter to them. I'm sure BJP will drop Hindutva if it finds that it's not going to get votes. So we had to argue with them that apart from the other aspects of economy and other things, the very core of India, the very essence of India, the everything that India is, is anathema to what they are going to do because it will ultimately, it will be suffering, but ultimately BJP will lose this battle, electorally and politically. It's the same thing, you know, with this Bilkis Bano case, what you're talking about. But I think if you have seen, it's the Hindus who are fighting for Muslims. In most of the cases, the people who are fighting their cases, who are there, when I say Hindus, they are not Hindus as Hindus, but they belong to that religion, like Gandhi belonged to the religion of Hinduism. But he was the greatest Hindu, but he was also the greatest humanist. So we need to have differences. I was in fact listening to that lecture by Gopal the other day in Calcutta. Then I went and bought that book. The book is on Gandhi and Tagore. So there is a letter from Mahadev Desai, who was himself a scholar, written to Tagore just think, about two years before he died. He says, Mr. Gandhi would like to know. Of course, it was Tagore who gave him Mahatma title. And Tagore uh, got the title of Gurudev from Gandhi. Gandhi's secretary, Mahadev Desai, writes a letter to Tagore, Dear Gurudev, we read reports that Harijans are leaving Hinduism and embracing Sikhism and that you are encouraging it. And um, I don't know how he addresses uh, Mahadev Desai, addresses Gandhi. I don't think he calls him Mahatma. Babu uh, was concerned about it and he wants to know your opinion. What is your opinion? And he also gives a brief description of what Hinduism is and what Sikhism is and what Harijans are there and what Gandhi is doing. What do you want to say about it? What is your opinion? So Tagore said, I'm not encouraging it, but if Harijans want to go to Sikhism because of the ills and the shameful things that happens in Hinduism, then I'm not going to stop them. You know, I'll be happy for them because Sikhism is a great religion. Just like I wouldn't stop them from going to Buddhism. So Tagore you know, stood his ground. He was not ready to placate Gandhi and neither Gandhi would. So we need that kind of discourse and debate to find a common ground. And I think both from the Congress side, because anything that you find on the other side, you want to oppose it. I had an uncle of my grand uncle called Puti Nasimachar, great poet. I asked him one day about one another Kannada person who was always controversial. I said, what do you think of him? He said that, um, he didn't give her a direct answer. He said, you know, there was a shipwrecked captain. There was an opposition leader which got shipwrecked on an island. He was an opposition leader. He was on an island. Nobody was there, uninhabited island. After a couple of years, he found a ship coming. And as the ship came, the captain came down. The first thing he said, are you the government? Are you the government? If you are the government, then I'm the opposition. Because he was an opposition leader in his <laughs> civilized life. So I think we need to have dialogue, ready to have dialogue on both sides. I think the problem today is whether it is in a farmer's laws or whether it is the issues of demonetization or any of these things. The thing is that we need dialogue 
and this is lacking even during you know of course during indira gandhi's time it was lacking even during congress's time why i said pseudo seculars was it was they who congress which stopped shabano case it was congress which on the one hand you know opposed triple talaq and bjp supported it saying that supreme court is supreme they have given it they had to emancipate women but in shabri malai congress supported shabri malai uh, uh, priests preventing women entering uh, temples insulating women entering temples so congress and bjp defied the supreme court so for triple talaq they said supreme court and in uh, uh, shabri malai they said you know supreme court cannot interfere with our faith so this double speak is there on both sides we need genuine dialogue uh, and finding a common ground and because why i am saying this is that uh, of course there are uh, fanatics in hindus and fanatics in uh, islam there may be a lot of terrorism around the world where islam is involved but when you look at the common muslims who are they they were harijans they were dalits tribals who got converted for whatever reason and uh, i've seen in, in my own company example in, in my own classmates you get messages today very regularly where somebody sends a message saying that it's a fake message as what you're talking i just got a message recently and i left the group because it said that you know in this country muslims have become from 20% to 80% in this country in lancaster town in uk the muslims have become india already 50% it will become 80% in muslims the government of india the modi government census itself says that the population ratio between both are has not changed poor muslims have more children poor indians have more children and when we say something and they say no 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 he is okay but you know muslims are not i'm taking the name because this is exactly how it was for untouchability everything is all right but you know i, I can't eat from his hands so i think we need to like tagore himself said and gandhi said this is a big blemish from our past but our glory and greatness is there but we can't you know drown ourselves in this glory thing by breaking up the demons of the past so i think it is the same thing for bilkis banu because i see a lot of women now hindu women coming up and saying we can't accept it that's the reason i quoted that dostoevsky that if a, if a mother finds her child raped and murdered hinduism doesn't preach it no religion does, uh, preaches it Are you Every as optimistic as me? Every essay in this book is an R.K. Lakshman cartoon in prose, with this difference that it carries in it the pain in the laughter and the thought in the joke. It is R.K. Lakshman in a non-cartoon form intended to say the following. This is Captain Gopinath speaking, not in his words, but in paraphrase. Captain Gopinath is not going to prove his patriotism to the right or his independence to the left. He is not in the business of proving himself to anyone except his own common sense and his own conscience. And there, I think, lies the. essentiality of the man which is also the essentiality of our situation where an honest position is out shouted by a more rhetorical expression and a genuine disagreement is drowned in the chorus of popular applause to demagoguery i do not have to paraphrase what he has said or elucidate what he has said in the last few minutes beyond this that today in india on the platter of political options fanaticism has become a sought after option fanaticism from being a despised extremity belonging to fringes has come to become a serious option being exercised by a lot of persons who one would have expected to act differently 
intolerance and fanaticism are two agnatic cousins. And the choice seems to me to be between a mild intolerance and a flaming fanaticism, completely outshadowing and outshouting the much greater alternative which we as a nation must face, which is of a democratic responsibility towards our republic and a republican accountability towards our democracy. These are our options. And the instruments of democracy, especially of electoral democracy, without being set aside by the alternative of a non-democratic polity, those instruments have become extremely efficient tools in the hands of forces that do not belong to the democratic fiber. The lack of democracy is common in almost every political party in India, and the ruling party is not to be faulted for being its shining example. All parties have to answer to the criticism of inner party non-democracy. This is the reality of our situation. And it is my belief, not just because one should not, on a happy occasion of a book launch, especially in this dichotomy of a darkened hall <laughs> and a brightly lit up stage, which almost mirrors the reality of our politics, where those on a pedestal <laughs> occupy the light and the majority stay in the dark. Especially in a situation like this, one cannot end on a gloomy note. And I believe that as long as somebody can write like Lakshman can cartoon, our future is safe. I can't ask that question and put Uma in a spot. So I'll go to the next one. <laughs> I don't know if you read the article titled, Is Our Paradise Lost? He relates the Shal Shahib incident, going back to his father and grandfather. And you end up by saying, villages still preserve much of the past, but the cities are becoming cesspools of hatred, overcome by senseless violence with an uneasy calm between communities. This theme runs across several of his articles. There is, in the land of myriad gods, which temple shall we go on to? There is this constant thread through the captain's writings, a longing for a simpler, perhaps, village life of an earlier era, a longing for the genuine, the sincere, the unpretentious. He is lucky he maintains a large estate and his connection to the soil. But what can we do to reverse what's happening in urban India today? And how can we city slickers reach out to grasp that simple, that genuine, that sincere part of life? That's quite a question. <laughs> <laughs> That's something that we all struggle with, right? Yes, and we all aspire absolutely. to someday. We'll absolutely. give up all of these things yes. and go and live on a farmland. <laughs> yes. As the book also does touch upon, and as Captain Gopinath spoke also, mm -hmm. perhaps that uh, nostalgia that we have for the past has to be tempered by a recognition that it was not all an unnuanced green paradise of happiness. There was bonded labor, there was caste exploitation, there was inequality, and many of these practices continue today. They have continued into the cities too, in different forms. Exploitation, squalor, inequality, different threads that used to hold us together getting broken. There was, however, perhaps less of a sense of polarization in the past, as the Shaul Sahib incident does talk about. That Shaul Sahib incident is very beautiful. And, um, you know, you need to read the book uh, to read about it. I'm not going to recount it here. But the fact that there was so much give and take, literally that was about give and take, about uh, a gentleman actually just literally picking up this beautiful embroidered shawl and wrapping it around himself. It belongs to somebody else. He doesn't bother to ask. In those days, perhaps you didn't need to ask. And that was the definition of neighborliness. And uh, certainly that's something that in cities we're struggling with in urban life. 
we've gone through a particularly harrowing week in Bangalore with the rains and with the kind of struggles and devastation that it has caused, and especially on the weakest and most vulnerable groups among us. We've also seen during the pandemic that, the, and you write about it, about how migrant workers and the vulnerable, the people without uh, the protections, social protections and other protections, have struggled during a situation which is as widespread a disaster as the pandemic. And maybe the solution, to work towards the solution, I'd go back to something that Mr. Gandhi said just now, that what we really need is more of, you know, not veering to the right or not veering to the left, but actually finding our true north, finding our sense, our common sense, and finding a way back to our conscience. I think somewhere we need to individually chart that journey, that trajectory. We need to individually make that journey back. And that's why reading, being aware, being informed about what's happening. This morning, my son, he's a teenager, was attending a Zoom call about, you know, presentations for some competitive exams and things that they're supposed to take, the aptitude test, SAT, and so on. So the, the coach there said that, you know, to learn lots of new words, you need to read the New York Times or you need to read the Wall Street Journal, things like that. So my husband and I were just explaining to him that it's not just to learn new words, but to actually understand what's happening in the world. You need to read the newspapers. You need to read and be informed about what's happening around you, not only to stay informed, but also as a responsible part of your citizenship, as a responsible part of being in this nation, it's been 75 years since people like Mahatma Gandhi and Tagore and others fought for the very freedom that allows us to sit here and talk about what we've done so far. And so I think all of us as a nation, as people, as people not here on the pedestal, but people in the beyond, need to chart that individual course, find our way back. Common sense requires us to actually know what's going on. But the conscience is a lot harder. And finding that way is an individual and perilous journey that all of us have to do on our own. And that's something that has no shortcuts and um, has no circumlocutions, no, no other way around it, but to actually do the hard work of that. Skandar, do you want to respond to that as well? Have we moved way too away from Gandhian ideal of India being in its villages? That sort of longing comes across in Captain's writings and in many of our lives. Is it even possible to think about going back to village-centered life, rural life, that simplicity, that sincerity? I am not an authority on Gandhi as we might imagine. There are <laughs> others who are far more knowledgeable about him than I. But I think it is not a question of going back to the values, but of going forward on the road that has been already marked and laid and very clearly established mile by mile towards our future. It's just a question of going forward. And each person has to do this in her or his own way. And very self-critically and self-analytically. That is extremely important. I think Captain Gopinath mentioned this. This ability to criticize and analyze oneself is extremely important. Now, R.K. Lakshman has been slightly overdone in our conversation today, <laughs> but I would like to say this, that his was a loyalty to the Times of India, which is also fearless. In this essay on him, he says that when Captain Gopina said, if we can use the common man mascot, will the Times of India object? He said, we will ask them to buzz off. <laughs> So he never sent a single carton to another newspaper, but he was so completely fearless. Fearlessness in loyalty and criticism, self-criticism in one's own estimation of oneself is extremely important. That ability to self-analyze and self-criticize, which is essential to democracy, is also at a discount. We do not know of a single politician today who laughs at himself they will excoriate the other person in sarcasm. But it is a long time since we heard a joke at one's own expense from the echelons of politics. And here I must say, using my own medication, I refer to the Taj Mahal. We should not romanticize what we have either. 
And I will conclude by saying that when the then Vice President of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, and his wife, Zenile Mbeki, were visiting India, they visited the Taj Mahal, and I was on what may be called official duty. When they arrive, the guide there welcomes them, saying, Welcome, Your Excellencies, to this monument to love, where lies buried the great Mumtaz Mahal, mother of the emperor's 14 children. And Zenile Mbeki said, what? <laughs> 14 children? Yes, Your Excellency. She was the mother of his 14 children and died in the 14th child. And she said, I am not going in. She said, I am not going in. And then Mbeki went up to her and must have said something to her like, don't create a diplomatic scandal, you have to come in. <laughs> and she, but one has to be objective. The Taj Mahal is a monument to love, but we should also know that postpartum hemorrhage, child marriage, childbearing, the women in India suffering from account of what one of the speakers had said, the institution of mindless marriage and motherhood. These are things which we should all remember. So at every stage, and non-romantic but idealistic adherence to values, self-criticism, and fearlessness in loyalty are some of the ways in which we can go forward rather than hark back. So there is there's one aspect in which the captain does not romanticize at all. He's hard-headed completely. And that's when it comes to the question of China. There's a piece that you wrote after the Galwan incident. And you say, never appease a bully. It will only embolden them. A military assault must be answered by military retaliation, not diplomacy and dialogue. That's a hard stand to take. And I was wondering if you as a diplomat would agree that when there is an aggression, you can't sort of answer it by diplomacy. Rather, you'll have to answer it militarily. No, there is really very little for me to add now, except I think to, to request you, madam, to take the mic and speak on behalf of what I have always regarded as an extremely important factor in our life, which is a fiercely work-oriented, self-unsparing, but utterly fearless administrative apparatus. To be able to say, I'm sorry, madam, I'm sorry, sir, this is not right. You cannot do this. Not under the law, not under the constitution, not under our scroll of precedence, not done. And to take the consequences. I think the bureaucracy is underestimating itself. So is our diplomatic arm. This is not to say that they should speak out of turn or become addicted to media channels, no. But there are ample ways and ample opportunities for India to find in its bureaucracy and in its police and other arms of the administration the wherewithal of a healthy governance. Captain Gopinath has been in the Defence Forces. His descriptions of his work in that field have, are one of the nuggets of this book. He knows what discipline means. He also knows what within a service, within an administrative apparatus, the honest expression of views is so important. There would have been a hundred mistakes committed by the newly installed government of India in 1947 if it had forsaken the Indian civil service, which Sardar Vallabhai Patel decided very prudently to retain and respect and utilize. And they saw in him a practical pol political executive, just as he saw in them a very e efficient and hardworking instrument. I feel one of the salvagings that are necessary today is the retrieval of the fearless objectivity exercised by a civil service with due humility and no ambition. On humility, I must say again, Captain Gopinath is a great example but he is an example in his own way of humility, which reminds me of Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel, who was once listening to her minister 
saying he is a very humble person about himself and she shot him down saying stop that humble humble business you are not so great captain gopinath's humility is not the humility that wants to be called humble and great it is the humility of reality you want to take that on the prescription that you have made for dealing with china of course i was in the china border and i also had a, a commander on chel narahari who everybody in the army knows much after i left the army but earlier you know after the 62 war when general sagat singh was there when china intruded into india see the rules are very clear that uh, of course you can do whatever diplomacy it is but if there is a violation in the border you do not wait and try to get permission from the commander the commander then talks to the his commander then it goes to the defense secretary then defense secretary goes to the chief of army staff then goes to the chief of defense staff then it goes to the defense secretary defense minister goes to the prime minister no because some things are already laid out that if there is a violation you hit back immediately see is like this in, in your own farm for example i have experienced it if there is a guy next to you you want to encroach his land but he's a poor farmer if he comes attacking you you are you're not going to mess with him so wars are won by the armies of course armaments matter but those who resolve to win always win right if you uh, brave death you drive him into the enemy's camp when I mean, there's what napoleon said you brave death you drive him into the enemy's camp moment china intruded immediately there is no question of the because the rules are clear that you cannot allow them to intrude because there is uh, whatever has been laid out if at that time you know you have to hit back and hit back hard and then you know you continue the diplomacy also but if you allow them to walk over you then you know to that extent you become always weaker that's what i'm trying to say that in it has happened earlier both during general arari's time and general sagat singh's time he when china uh, intruded in the uh, nathula he moved uh, the, the troops he moved the guns and uh, rained uh, mortars he, he didn't ask he didn't wait for uh, permission from the congress party which was in power then he just moved heaven and earth and brought such a rain of uh, troops and men china we drew because they know that you can't do it unless you are going to incur a lot of heavy casualties and you are going to get a war see when a bully bullies you in your life also you have to stand up and it is not uh, what do you call the armament it is how you fight in every war and our troops do it clear instructions must be given but i think what has happened now is that there is too much of centralization so everybody wants to look up and find out whether they can do it just like in the civil service there was a riot in uh, mangalore some churches were vandalized the superintendent of police there his vote is to the constitution is not is vote is not to the ruling party he has a book he has to immediately come down heavy force and put down the rioters regardless of which religion which and so on. that was not done in case of in mangalore for example a few years ago when the churches were vandalized the superintendent of police knows that it is a bjp government or it is a congress government so let's say it is a muslim son he knows there is a congress party and there is a feeling that the congress you know will not uh, allow uh, heavy action against muslims because it is a vote bank of uh, peace and muslims so they look up to get instructions what he should do and same thing you know if there is a right wing saffron party vandalizing muslims or christians which has happened in innocently you do not have action taken on the spot so i think it's the same with the chinese border you know you, they have the freedom the rules are very clear they should go and i remember because general narari he came to my farm he stayed with me he was also i made him the chairman of my company and he is very well known there's a book on it he was a, a core commander in the northeast in uh, arunachal pradesh he moved heavy troops and armament everything and uh, he didn't wait for uh, permission because he is already been told that this is the rules that you can't allow the enemy to cross a line of control whatever line of control we have agreed on i think that was not done in both the cases because there is a fear you know that uh, what will happen you know uh, if i do it will i get posted out will i be you know, they will say that look who asked you to attack and i think he mentioned one more thing that you know what what we need today whether it's in the army is in the civil service you know we have got great civil servants we all of course there are bad bad exe everywhere a great civil servants all that they have to do is to stand up and say no i remember once uh, one one joint secretary told me that he was personal secretary to 
I think Sukran. So this guy told him, sir, you know, this rules and this rules and this rules. I can't do it. He says, the Kaumaja. Now this is a true story. He says, the Kaumaja. So he brought the book. He said, this is the book. He tore that page. He said, Abhi Maja Dikhao. Kaha hai? <laughs> so you have got also ministers like that. You know, it's not easy for a civil servant. So there is a story I've written in my uh, book where General Manik Shah, which everybody knows, when uh, he was asked uh, by Indra Gandhi for the Bangladesh, I was in the Bangladesh war, that uh, she called him, there's a whole uh, cabinet there, and she said, I want the attack to happen immediately. Because she had already gone abroad and 10 million immigrants had poured into India. Our Indian army was already inside Bangladesh. My unit officers were already in Bangladesh three months before the war. Some of them were there one year before the war, training the Mukti Bahini. She said, I want the attack to happen. And he said, no, it is there in my book. He said, no. He says, I'm not here to kill my troops. I'm not going to attack now because we are not ready. It takes time to mobilize. I can attack in December, but now if I attack, Bangladesh will be in floods. I will not be able to, this one, and China can move in because there's no snow in the mountains and uh, I'll not be able to do it. Give me six months in December. I'll do it in December. And he walked out. Then he was called again at, uh, I think, five o'clock in the evening. So he took his resignation paper, knowing what Indira Gandhi is. He said, ma'am, do you want my resignation paper? He said, no. I said, I think what you said is true. You, you said, no. Bluntly, I agree with you. Let's attack in December. Prepare. I think there are bureaucrats who do it. I'm not saying not everybody. Does it. What he's saying is that if the bureaucracy and the police stand up to the politicians, and not all politicians are bad, they are we in the mirror, ultimately. <laughs> so not all politicians are bad. But if the bureaucracy, and this is because the rules are very clear, our civil service rules are very clear. It's written in stone, actually. So if they stand up, you know, and uh, I also have uh, good friends of mine here from the police. Uh, some of them have told me stories where they have stood up. And, um, well, you know, I don't think anything happens. Maybe you'll get transferred. But nobody will touch a person who is solid. Umar, you want to take the question on integrity and speaking truth to power? Speaking truth to power has always been the creed of uh, Sardar Patel's civil service. Harken back to his very, very uh, strong commitment to the need for civil servants to stand up and say that, you know, this is the right thing to do or this is not the right thing to do, but whatever it may be, to speak their mind and to speak their mind fearlessly. But I'd like to expand that, that it's a feature not just of the civil service, the civil service, the political leadership, all of us are part of a society. And there I'd like to come back to R.K. Lakshman as uh, so you were saying that here as a cartoonist, he was ready to tell the Times of India to buzz off. So that fearlessness and that loyalty and that integrity is something that all of us probably need to get back to and find our ways back to in whatever we do. That commitment to ethics, that commitment to basic values and integrity is and to speaking out in an informed and in a courageous way is something that all of us really need to think about. And I'd like to really say that progress in that sense is not a straight line. It will be two steps forward. And that's something else that the civil service, working in the civil service has taught me, that it will be two steps forward and one step back in whatever we are doing. There will be challenges and we'll have to do the same. But as long as we can keep pushing forward in whatever it is that we do, in whichever part of society we are in, because nation building is not a one-time event. Nation building requires all of us to work. And it's a continuous process to perfect the republic. And that's something that requires all of us to speak truth to ourselves. So on that note, we'll end and we'll think about all that the captain has written in the book. Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you like what you heard, please share it with family and friends. You can also leave us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible are Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studios. 
don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to get regular updates on our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.